you talk to different Christians, you may find that different Christians have different visions of what it means to live a Christian life. We have different expectations when it comes to spiritual growth, and we have different emphases when it comes to the scope of our journey and what's the more important part and what should we expect. Many times we think about Christianity primarily in terms of our conversion experience. We remember the moment, and, and it was a, a rich moment when we, when we first met Jesus and when we experienced the freedom that comes in Christ and when we experienced what, what, it, what it feels like to be united with Him and drawn to Him and forgiven by Him and all of the richness that comes with that. Others of us may remember a crucial point sometime after our conversion where we were struggling with one particular thing and, and we needed the Lord to, to minister to us in, in deep ways and, and He did and He was there and He was present and, and, and He cared for us and we, we had this memory and this, this deep, rich moment that we draw so much of our identity from. Others come to the Christian life and think, well, you know, you've got converted and now it's really just about keeping the rules. You've got to act like a good Christian and behave the right way. Others think, you know, you've, you've become a Christian and Jesus was always trying to correct the rule keepers. And so maybe that's not such a big deal. And, you know, we can just be authentic and honest about where we are in our lives and just kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's okay and we, can, we, we don't have to be hypocrites and false because everybody's got junk after all. And so there are a lot of these different visions and we focus on different aspects of our life, conversion, after conversion, attitudes and approaches and rules and ethics and behavior and what does it mean and, and all of these kinds of things. And it turns out when we come to the scriptures that there's a rich vision of the Christian life and what the Lord Jesus wants to do in our lives that really kind of pushes back against all of our constructs. It really kind of challenges the way that we assume things are supposed to go. And it raises questions for us when we ask about what Jesus wants for us after our conversion experience, after we've met him. I think one thing most of us can probably agree on is that we're supposed to grow somewhat. Jesus didn't rescue us just to leave us in that same place. So whether we're focused on specific standards or whether we're focused on just free grace or whether... Whatever it is, we know that Jesus wants to do something in us. The questions that then arise is, how much does he want to do and how does he do it? How much does he want to do and how does he want to do it? And the language that we use to talk about what he wants to do and how he wants to do it. How do we talk about his work in our lives? One of the common ways we talk about it is spiritual formation. You meet Jesus, you become a believer. It could happen as a child, it could happen as an adult, it could happen in a variety of ways. But after that, he wants to form us. He wants to make us into certain kinds of people. Romans 6 is very much about how he makes us into certain kinds of people. How he makes us into people who embody his character. How he forms us as Christians. And it deals with the question of how much he wants to do, and it deals with how he goes about doing it. And as we ask that question, how does he actually form us? How does Jesus work within us to reproduce his life and his character in us? How does he do it? We find that it takes discipline. Paul talks about submitting your body to one or another. We'll talk about that in detail in a minute. For now... Maybe we can sum it up this way. There's no spiritual formation without spiritual discipline. That big idea runs all the way through 
this passage of Scripture, and it challenges every aspect of our lives. No formation without discipline. No spiritual formation without spiritual discipline. Let's talk about that. First of all, what's the expectation? Like When we're talking about growth, when we're talking about formation, how much does Paul expect? And really, it's surprising to a lot of us. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember the mid-90s. I won't ask for a show of hands. But they had these keychains in the mid-90s, maybe it was the late 90s even, if you remember that. And, and they said, Christians aren't perfect, just... Ah, you do remember, well done, at least three of you, that's good. Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. And sometimes there were t-shirts, and I think I remember a bumper sticker or two, and you could drive down the highway, and somebody's flying along 30 miles over the speed limit, and you know they're not perfect, but they are forgiven. I wonder what Paul would say if he saw a bumper sticker like that. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? And he's really answering questions that come up after chapter 5 where he talked about how sin came into the world through one man and spread to everyone. And, but, and that's devastating news that there's just the scope of human sin is unlimited it's just it's this massive extensive universal reality and yet Jesus comes and where sin spread Paul says grace abounded it's super abounded that's a literal translation super abounded is what he says where sin spread grace super abounded it spread even more so think about the scope of sin it's universal reach in humanity in, in all of us it None of us escape this, and yet the grace of God reaches even further and reaches even deeper. And so then somebody kind of comes with Paul as like this imaginary questioner, and they kind of bring up these questions and go, well, hey, that sounds like a pretty good deal, Paul, because I really like my sin. It's quite enjoyable most of the time. I mean, you know how this goes, and it's a little self-indulgence. It can feel really good, and you know, if if I can sin and Jesus can do his grace thing, and if I've got this much sin and grace is that much bigger, then I can do my sin thing and Jesus can do his grace thing, and we're all happy. And Paul says, if that's what you think, you can get forgiven and just go on in sin, you have no idea what Jesus is about. What then shall we say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? Should we continue in sin? And I bet most of us, at least those of us from the 90s, would say, well, I had that bumper sticker. Nobody's perfect, Paul. Come on. And Paul's answer is emphatic. Absolutely not. By no means. Paul's answer to the problem of sin isn't, you know, well, that's just part of life, or Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven, or, you know, Paul, I got this thing I'm struggling with, and I don't know what to do about it, and I'm just having a hard time letting Jesus have control of that part of my life. What do I do? His answer is not, you know, it's just part of life. You're human. Nobody's perfect. His answer is stop it now. Why? Because Jesus, in his perfect love, and his abundant grace has taken hold of you and united you to himself. And the life he lives, he lives to God. And he wants to reproduce that life in you. Now, does that mean Paul expects the Romans to just be perfect today? That's not what he's talking about. The question he's asking is are we making excuses for sin? Or are we surrendering ourselves to Jesus? You know, when something comes up at work, or maybe there's a thing at home, and there's conflict, and I'm just wanting to, in, like, I'm right and you're wrong. Am I making excuses and justifying my self-focus? Or am I surrendered to the one who loved us and gave himself for us. And Paul's not kind of like saying, you got perfect people and imperfect people. He's saying you have people who are surrendered to Jesus and people who are serving themselves. And his exhortation to the Romans and his exhortation to us is, do not let sin reign in your life and in your heart. And that, friends, I get it. That is a... 
stunning thing to say. And sometimes it's kind of discouraging. <laughs> like, really, Paul? I mean, I'm not feeling too holy today. I just yelled at my kids and was abrupt and unkind to my team at work, and they're all nodding back there going, yeah, it happens, you know. And like, I'm not feeling this. And his answer isn't, well, that means you don't know Jesus and you're lousy and just go do something else. His answer is, where sin increased, grace abounds. And the Lord Jesus Christ is at work. And in this moment, in this moment, right now, as you are experiencing the conviction of the Holy Spirit and you're reflecting on the words of Scripture and you know you did it wrong and you know you said things you shouldn't have said, but in this moment, when you feel his conviction, can you surrender to him? Now, the answer is, by his grace, yes, then we are right where the apostle wants us to be. Let's read on a little bit and kind of understand how he thinks about these things. Shall we continue in sin, right, so that we can get more grace, right? More sin obviously equals more grace. And Paul says, <laughs> no, a thousand times no, by no means. Then he raises the question, that, and, and it's one of those rhetorical questions where you're not really supposed to have to answer it. The answer's obvious. How can we, who died to sin, go on living in it? Don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? And for Paul, right, this, this, this giving of water, this, this reception of water, is, is, it marks and symbolizes and extends and, and works mysteriously and beautifully this union with Christ. And you, you, you are joined to him in his death and you're given union with him. And the consequence of that union means that whatever's true of him is also true of you. Say that again, when you get joined to Jesus, whatever's true of him is true of you. And we struggle to understand this sometimes in our context because we're deeply, like, our, like individual identity is everything for us. Like in the ancient world, your family identity, your city identity, that governed everything. For us, we kind of want to be our own person. You know, don't tell me who I am. I define who I am as a status quo in our culture. So we kind of struggle with this. But this kind of thing is present in some places. It's present on sports fields. Right? When the captain goes out before a ball game and they flip the coin, and the captain calls the toss, and whatever he says applies to everybody with the same color shirt on. Whatever's true of that captain is true for the rest of the team. He doesn't go and say, hey, we'll defend the south end zone, and everybody runs off to the north one. Right? They follow the captain. He does something and accounts for everyone. Everyone's identity is defined by one person's action. So when Jesus dies to sin and is raised, whatever's true for him counts for everyone who's on his team. If you're wearing the same color jersey as Jesus, whatever, whatever he does is applied to your life. So what did he do? Well, Before you answer what he did, we need to know the purpose of what he did, verse 4, is so that you may have newness of life. Right? So that your life right now isn't marked by darkness and shame and condemnation and unholiness, brokenness, but is instead marked by Life and glory and beauty and acceptance by Christ and forgiveness and wholeness and holiness, we're going to find out. Okay, so that's a big idea, Paul. Flesh it out for us. What did Jesus, like, what's he done and how does it work? Verse 5, for if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will be united with him in a resurrection like his. So for Paul, like everything is an in-between story. You've got Jesus' death on one hand, Jesus' resurrection on the other. And that big picture thing shapes the Christian story. So we've been united with him in his death in baptism. We can hope, therefore, that whatever's true of him is going to be true for us. And what's true of him? He's been raised bodily from the dead. And that means, if you belong to him, what happens to you? 
raised bodily from the dead. That hasn't happened yet. Just check. Nobody. Didn't think so. It hasn't happened to me. I don't see any of you who look resurrected. Everybody, honestly, maybe it's a little early in the morning. I don't know. That's coming later. Jesus comes back. He raises his people from the dead. We're waiting for that. Big picture, bookend, fact. What happens in the middle? We will be united with him in a resurrection like his. Death and life shape the story. Death and life shape your story. Die to sin, live with Christ. Well, what happened in the death part? Verse 6. Well, our old self, right, the self that is a slave to sin, the body that is a slave to death and sin, dies. It's crucified. Jesus died a real death so that our old life, our sinful self, our corrupted nature, the image of God broken and that is a slave to sin, could be put to death. Right? Our old self crucified with him so that the body of sin, not the body itself, but the body as a slave to sin, might be destroyed. So that sin's captive on our bodies can be broken. That's why Jesus died. Teach, and, and here's the thing, friends, and this is crucial. Yes, Jesus died so that our sins could be forgiven. That is crucial. It is important. It is to be celebrated, but it is a means to an end. Jesus did not die. If there's one thing we get in Romans 6, it is that Jesus did not die so that we could get forgiven and keep on doing the things we need forgiven for. Jesus died so that we could be forgiven. We come to body, embody the character of Jesus. Newness of life. Sin's hold is broken. If it doesn't have authority over Jesus, it doesn't have authority over you because you've been joined to him and what's true of him is true of you. We know that our old self, verse 6, was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. Like, like let that settle for a moment because a, like, a lot of us, remember, not perfect, just forgiven. What does that mean? It means I can be forgiven and have no real expectation for significant growth in my spiritual life. That's what that means. I can make excuses for my, you know, every time you see the fish or the bumper sticker on the car and it's going wet, like getting pulled over and you're thinking, real good witness there, brother in Christ, right? Well, yeah, it doesn't matter what we do because we're forgiven. We don't have to have any real expectations. We don't have to worry about our witness because we're forgiven. And Paul's answer is, listen to me, you are not a slave to sin. So the next time you're in that moment and it feels inescapable, grace is sufficient. The next time you're in that moment and it feels like you can't escape, you feel like a slave and it's in your heart and you know it's wrong and you, I just, I'm drawn to it and I can't stop and it, it, I, just, I feel compelled, Jesus has what you need. He died to set you free. Whatever it is. Anger. Alcohol, lust, work, marriage, family, wherever the place is where Jesus isn't Lord and sin is Lord, He died to set you free, to make you whole. It's true of Him. So it's true of you. If we've died with Christ, verse 8, we believe we'll live with him. We see this progress. Jesus died. Jesus was raised. You died with Christ. You will live with him at his resurrection. And in the meantime, that means that the character of your life is different. You're not a slave. You are free. Any Christian who walks around believing they are slave to sin is believing a lie. And 
has not yet come to know the full power of the cross of Jesus Christ. If we have died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. That's an old word for authority. Death no longer has authority over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. And so the character of his life, the, 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 the nature of his life is fully given to God. And there's no threat of sin and there's no threat of death and there's no threat of shame and there's no threat of sorrow and there's, there's no more moments in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is tempted to actually forsake his messianic vocation and go do something else and preserve his life and avoid the pain. There's no more temptation for him. There's no more, I feel torn and death is weighing down on me. And, I, and in that moment, death has authority over him and death has dominion over him. But the death he died, he died to sin and to death once for all. And that power is broken. And now he lives and he is alive and he'll never die again. And he'll never be tempted, and the life he lives, he lives to God. And Paul's answer to that is, whatever's true of him is true of you. So if Jesus is living a life to God, if you belong to him, if you've been united to him, reckon yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. And that means Jesus actually begins to change patterns. Thinking patterns, behavior patterns, addiction patterns, sin patterns, all of it. He changes patterns. And that change is what we call spiritual formation. The life he lives, he lives to God, and he wants to re reproduce that life in us. And that change, that transformation is what we call spiritual formation. It's what we call sanctification. It's what we call growth in holiness. And it's all a work of grace. It is a work of his grace. We talk about the scope. The scope of his work is broader than we thought. It leaves no stone unturned. No corner of our hearts are immune to the light of his grace. There is nothing in our lives that he cannot heal. The question now becomes, how does he do it? And this is where spiritual discipline comes in. Remember, no spiritual formation without spiritual discipline. Spiritual formation is the change, the transformation, the growth, the wholeness, the holiness, the maturity. All of these words get at this idea of Christian formation. How does he do it? Paul says he does it through spiritual disciplines. Verse 12, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members, and in this translation when it says members, some of you have translations that may say parts of your body, like we're talking about arms and legs and eyes and tongues and vocal cords and brains and like every part of your body, that's what he's talking about. So don't take the parts of your body and submit it to sin. Don't present the parts of your body as instruments of wickedness. Instead, in contrast, present yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life, because remember the death and resurrection of Jesus governs the life of the believer. Jesus has been brought from death to life. That means you embody newness of life. Present yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life and present your members, right? The parts of your body, your brain, hands, arms, vocal cords, eyes, all of it, your whole self, the parts of your bodies. Present the parts of your bodies to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace question comes up again, what then should we sin because we're not under law but under grace, right? Grace, Paul, grace, more grace, more sin, it's okay, we're going to work out, it's going to work out. And Paul says, no, 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 no. And then he says, verse 16, don't you know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one to whom you obey, 
either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. This is where this process comes in. Because each day for us, every day, every moment, we are either presenting ourselves to sin or to Jesus. And if we forget that, that's dangerous. There's a mindfulness and awareness that every moment right now, I am presenting myself either to sin or to Jesus. So I'm at school. Maybe I'm a sophomore or a junior. Either way, the peer pressure is intense. And my friends are <laughs> talking about their date from the other night. It's not holy. In that moment, am I presenting myself to sin or to Jesus? A couple people in my family, they've got a conflict. I don't really like either one of them. Might be kind of fun to twist that up a little bit. I don't have to see him at Christmas. What's the big deal, right? In that moment, am I submitting myself to sin or to Jesus? Tomorrow I'll go to work. I'll probably be tired. Sundays take a lot out of me. My temper might be short. Knowing that ahead of time, can I be prepared? To submit myself to Jesus instead of to sin? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Process. Now here's the thing. If you present yourselves, do you not know, verse 16, that if you present yourselves as to anyone as obedient slaves, your slaves are the one whom you obey. Either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. So if on Monday, I stoke the conflict in my family, and on Tuesday, I'm not patient with my kids, and on Wednesday, I'm unkind to my staff, and on Thursday, I'm just lazy and don't do my sermon prep, then I'm creating habits of submission to sin. And sin's power, which I've been set free from, I'm slowly but surely yielding territory. And every time, give a little more back. We spent some time reflecting on how our bodies get involved with this in this series, and we spent some time last week, we were looking at Romans 1, we we're talking about sin, we talked about how our brains are full of little cells called neurons, and how those cells link up when we do new things, and how every time we do that new thing again, and the new thing becomes an old thing, the older it becomes, the stronger those links become little impulses going along and some chemicals grow around and it just gets easier. This is how, this is how athletes get to where they can hit 100 mile an hour baseballs, actually. Because nobody's supposed to actually be able to do that, apparently, scientifically. But if you start when you're five and you kind of work on it and the batting cage is going kind of slow and you kind of develop those skills, by the time you're 12, you know, you, you've got a little bit more than you used to. Maybe you can hit one that's 55 miles an hour, and you kind of you have an instinct for it. It's not really an instinct. It's a brain synapse because you've been training your body for years. You work a little bit harder. There's a kid in the next league. He can throw a little bit harder, but you've been, you've been practicing for five, six, seven years, and you know what to expect, and you're getting to where you can trust your skill because, hey, 10 years now, after all, Dad was playing catch with you in the backyard and throwing baseballs, and sure, you missed a lot back then, but you've been working hard, and you don't realize it, but in your brain and in your muscles, there are physical changes happening. Muscle memory. So you don't even have to 
think about it. You see it, you hit it. And it seems so natural and it feels so easy, but it's not easy. You've been working on it for at least 10 years and you keep working on it. You get to high school, the pitches are even faster. You keep working. Those connections in your brain keep strengthening because you're going to the batting cages. You're doing the drills. You realize that tees aren't for the five-year-olds. The pros hit off tees all off-season. And so you get out in the backyard and you hit 100 baseballs off a tee every day, your 10th grade year, 12th grade. Division one shows up. They scout you out. This guy's got what it takes. You get to college, the pitches are a little faster than they used to be. The curveball, cur it's a little trickier than it used to be, but you've been working at it. And you've been developing skill and you've been developing discipline 15 years now. You still go to that tea in the afternoons. Get dad. He doesn't throw as hard as he used to, but it's still good to come out and play a little catch in the backyard. We understand that all of life is about developing discipline. We understand it on the ball field. We understand it at work. If I want to get ahead, I got to work. I got to develop my skills. Got to do some continuing education. Got to read the relevant literature. Got to go through the training because it's about skill. And every one of those things creates patterns in our bodies, in our brains, in our muscles, creates tendencies, creates just these these sensibilities that just are formed over years, even decades. So when we see a problem, we know what the problem is, we know what to do about the problem, not because we're just sharp, we've been working on it for a long time. And the longer we work on it, the more we change, and the stronger it gets. And that works negatively, right, with addictions. The longer we give ourselves to whatever the thing is that addicts us, the stronger its hold is. Doesn't mean there's no hope. Amen? Does mean there's more work. Does mean you need grace. So we talked about how negative that can be when it comes to sin. Now we're talking about how formative it can be when it comes to holiness. So what happens, you know, if <laughs> I actually do read my Bible seriously for a year I know that sounds hard and big and tough, but hey, you know, I'll spend two hours on the T developing those skills. What if we actually do it, you know, and we sit down that first day and it's really hard and it's really difficult and, and it feels awkward and maybe we're tired and, you know, I'd rather just go back to sleep and I have no idea what he's talking about and did this guy write in Greek and who speaks Greek anymore and like, this is hard, and I don't, like, I don't even like to read. I'd rather look at Facebook or whatever you look at these days. And, and all of these things come in, and we just fall away after three days because it's hard. It's hard. And I'd love to pray. I have no idea where to start. And I know that Jesus wants me to go to church and worship, but... Good grief, it's my only day off. What does he expect? It's hard. What would happen if we took these principles from the other parts of our lives where we give ourselves energetically, whether it's athletics or our careers, and we know those principles and we know that the heart, we may not be neuroscientists, but we know that something's going on and something is developing and our brains are changing and those parts are growing. And, you know, I read it the other day about uh, violinists. I don't know if anybody plays the violin. If you do, we'll get you in the band here before too long because I love violins. But people who play the violin, your left hand actually gets bigger than your right hand because you're working it out. Kind of with guitars too a little bit. I noticed back in the day I could stretch a little bit more on my left hand than my right your left hand gets bigger than your right hand because you're developing the muscles. And actually in violinists, if you scan their brains, the part of the brain that controls the left hand grows too. Can't see it, but it's happening. And so we know, 
We know that if we give ourselves, if we give ourselves to disciplines and activities and good and healthy things, they are hard to begin with. And yeah, that note was a little flat that time, but keep working on it and your ear will develop. We give ourselves to these things and we work at them and, and we, we, we develop the disciplines and eventually you can't get it wrong. never miss not because you're uber talented because God designed your body to work this way because (laughs) listen to it again don't you know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves your slaves are the one you obey either sin which leads to death or obedience that leads to righteousness you can apply that to any area of your life including your spirituality and this is the thing right we sort of take our spiritual lives and we section those off and go well here's my spiritual life and Jesus saved me and I'm not really sure else what he's supposed to do but here it is and we'll just kind of let that be and I'm going to go hit some baseballs because I know if I work really hard at baseball and I, maybe I'll get a scholarship or something and we kind of we know in like the rest of our life, that hard work and discipline, and if you submit yourselves to the coach, you will improve. We know that. But somehow we section off our spiritual life and go, well, I just, I don't know what to do. I'm struggling and I can't, I don't have. We're whole creatures. There's no like magic pill to the spiritual life that makes it function differently than everything else in our lives. We're whole creatures. We're not just spirits trapped in bodies. We are bodies designed to embody the image of God. And you're going, so wait a minute, preacher, you're telling me that if I put energy into reading the Bible like I put into throwing baseballs, that my spiritual life will improve? Isn't that cheating? Like, where is grace in that? Come on. You're... And somebody's thinking this, right? It feels like cheating. Surely it's not a function. Surely, like, like, I can't just sort of read my Bible for 30 minutes a day for eight weeks and all of a sudden I'm holy, right? That's, that's crazy. Like, where is God in that? And, and that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that there's a sort of a magic formula where you can just kind of read your Bible and go to church and pray and all of a sudden you're holy because you did it X number of hours. What I am saying is that God has made us to function in certain ways. And when we cultivate spiritual disciplines, it yields spiritual formation. In the same way, when we cultivate athletic disciplines, it cultivates athletic formation, right? The T isn't a like some kids work on the tee and they just, they never become baseball players. <laughs> you know, they don't, they get discouraged and they go away. And it's not, again, like anybody who's done it knows it's not a formula. It's about becoming a certain kind of person. It's not a formula. It's about becoming a certain kind of person. The kind of person who sees it and does it. Reading your Bible isn't a formula. If you read your Bible, you'll find that you're knowing God better. Prayer serving. Yeah, I'm going to give up my vacation time to go on this mission trip one of these days when we can actually fly on airplanes again, right? One of them, I'm, going to, I'm going to do that. And that self-denial and self-giving love, there's something about it. God makes himself known. And it's not just that I'm sort of punching in disciplines and getting transformation. It's that God is using these patterns to make me into a certain kind of person to set me free from sin and to make me not just free, but a slave to righteousness. So when Paul says, submit your bodies and the parts of your bodies to God, what would happen if we take that seriously? Like if we get out of the mind of the, the way of thinking that like spirituality is just kind of like something that happens in my mind and in my you know spirit and my soul and whatever that even is and and like my body's not involved in that and I just can kind of be spiritual and like what if we get out of that habit of thinking and begin to realize that God has made us as integrated wholes and that our bodies are deeply involved in our spirituality and if we actually gave our bodies to read because you can't read without a body you can't pray without a body. 
can't experience God without a body. Because he made it that way for us to experience him like this. So what if we actually offer our bodies to him? In worship. I want to say something I've been thinking about for a while, and I've been hesitant to because I wasn't sure the time was right. I want you to hear my heart. It's been almost a year since churches shrunk their ministries. March 15th, we went to online worship only. Did that for three months, I think. And... A lot of us who had developed habits of worship began to lose them. And it became far easier to just watch it on YouTube or Facebook. And that started creating some other habits and some other changes. Now we don't have to worry about making sure the kids' socks match. And I can have my coffee. I understand that there is a continuing need for some of us to be in isolation you're in that vulnerable place and you feel that way, we are continuing and we are going to continue as much virtual connection as we can. We're committed to that. If we're not in one of those high vulnerable places and we're not scared and we're cool with going to the movies or to Walmart, I don't know if you can even go to the movies, but go into other places, restaurants, and church is like, ah, well, it's COVID. Consider that. Hear my heart. This isn't like Pastor Matt dropping condemnation bombs on folks who aren't going to church. This is understanding how God has made us to function. This is understanding how God has made us to function. And if we give ourselves to worship week in and week out, I'm going to go, I'm going to be there, I'm going to be present, I'm going to worship God with my body, in the room. And I'm going to do that habitually. And in six months, it'll be easier to not hit the snooze button. Because it's part of life. But then a global pandemic breaks out, and after three months, (laughs) I don't have to get up and take a shower and get dressed, because I can just flip on the live stream in a little while. And it's easy. But here's the thing, friends. Like, following Jesus is not supposed to be easy. It requires self-denial. Again, there are a lot of people, and I get this, and I want to say, I want to be clear. There are folks that I would counsel, like, stay home a little bit longer. Hey, be safe. There's extra risk. There's extra danger. But that's not the case for all of us. There's no spiritual formation without spiritual discipline, brothers and sisters. There's no spiritual formation without spiritual discipline. And the disciplines are the norm. Like, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel on the disciplines. They're normal things. Worship is a discipline. Reading the Bible is a discipline. Prayer is a discipline. If we neglect those things for other things, we are a slave of what we submit ourselves to. And we're not being, like, we're not just missing out on formation, we're actually being deformed. There's no neutrality in this. We're either being formed or deformed. Slaves to Jesus, slaves to sin.
verse 19, just as you once presented your, the parts of your body as slaves to impurity to greater and greater iniquity. There's that cumulative process. It gets worse and worse and worse. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification and better and better and better. No spiritual formation without spiritual discipline. And let me say this, friends. If you wait until you feel like it, you'll never do it. This is one of those things. <laughs> kind of like studying in college. I'll do that later. Watch a game. I'll feel like it later. Like if you wait until you feel like it, you never do it. If you're out of the habit of reading in the Bible and you wait till you feel like it, it won't happen. If you're out of the habit of going to church and you wait till you feel like it, it won't happen. What happens when we give ourselves to the disciplines for the, for, for the sake of formation is it actually changes our desires. It actually changes our desires. A lot of you know how this felt last March. Because you called me and you said, what do you mean I can't come to church? <laughs> Because you have decades of formative power where you show up and you worship and you're in community and it's crucial. Thanks be to God. And three months without that felt like deformation, didn't it? Your desires had been forged for years. You wanted to be with the church. When we think about discipline, it's crucial to keep the long game in play. This is about long-term formation. My heart isn't going to change tomorrow. But if I keep submitting myself to Jesus, the parts of my body, whether it's knees to kneel, hands to pray, eyes to read, bodies to worship, if I submit myself to Jesus, he will make me into a certain kind of person. And eventually, I will want to do it. I will want him more than anything else. It doesn't just happen. There's no formation without discipline. This is how we look to Christ.